So hello and good morning. And thank you all for joining us in person and for people who are online for what I hope is going to be an informative, interesting, and very thought-provoking conversation today. So my name is Jeanette Campbell, and I'm the CEO of the Ontario Disability Employment Network, also known as ODIN. And ODIN is a member network of more than 100 employment service providers and corporations across the province. And our common goal is to improve employment outcomes for job seekers who have a disability and to enable businesses to successfully access the talent that they need to meet their human resource demands. So we do this in lots of different ways, but the major way that we do this is by building capacity in the sector and helping the business community to build their capacity as well so that they're able to hire with motivated intent and manage their inclusion process as well. So today we've invited you to participate in a fireside chat with a panel of experts. The only thing that's missing is the fireplace, but we have a table instead. And our panelists are going to be sharing their thoughts on the topic of access to opportunity. In this event, we have aligned with National Accessibility Week. So that you know, National Accessibility Week takes place every year, starting in the last Sunday in May. And it's a time when accessibility and inclusion is promoted across communities, workplaces, and also a time to celebrate the contribution of all Canadians who have a disability. We also like to recognize the efforts of Canadians who are actively removing barriers and ensuring that all people have an opportunity to participate in all aspects of Canadian society. So here's what we know. The increased social and economic inclusion of people who have a disability has a positive effect on the economic and social benefits for all, for the person, for the business, for the economy, and for society in general. When people who have a disability can access employment, Canada's economy grows. Businesses have a chance to welcome more customers, their service satisfaction improves, and their workplace reflects the diversity of Canada. So today we, including all of you online, are a group of Canadians who have come together to strengthen the collaborative effort and create a country that is fully accessible and inclusive. The focus of this panel will be on it, on the accessibility of processes, of procedures, of systems that are going to ensure access to opportunity. And often when we think of disability, we think of something that can be easily identified. But disability comes in many forms. And to limit the conversation to just physical access can leave out a lot of people. And if businesses only think of physical access, they could be missing out on some incredible employees. I'm thinking about a woman that I know who's an intake worker in an emergency shelter in Hamilton who's blind. I'm thinking about a group of men in Milton who are working very hard, maybe right at this minute, on the production floor at Rockwell Insulation, and they're deaf. And I'm thinking about all of the young people who've been enjoying their first jobs ever. I'm smiling at the CNE, because they're at the CNE now. And these are young people who have a variety of different challenges and disabilities, things like learning disabilities, uh, cognitive disabilities, or mental health challenges. And for a lot of people, you might not be aware, but our major banks in Canada have been benefiting from hiring talent in the neurodiverse community. Their fraud detection departments have never been doing so well. So that, I hope, frames this conversation a little bit. Our panelists are going to discuss what access to opportunity means to them and why it is of importance to their business. And hopefully they're gonna provide us with some insights and some examples as well. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Lenore McAdam, Inclusion Lead with Deloitte Canada. Next to her, we have Anna Karina Tabunar, right? Tabunar? No. Tabunar, I slaughter words. <laughs> Director of Strategic Communications for Sodexo Canada. And then we have Vera Roberts, PhD, Academic Research Manager for the Inclusive Design Research Center at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. And then last but not least, we have Jake Allen Hirsch, who is the Higher Ed and Workforce Development Lead for LinkedIn Learning Canada. And Jake has also offered up this space because we are here at LinkedIn Canada's office in downtown Toronto 
in what we call Hoffman's Garage. So thank you for joining us panelists and sharing your thoughts and representing your organizations on this important topic. Your presence will bring, bring much to this conversation. Okay, are we ready to get this conversation started? Yes? Good. All right. Panelists, for this part of the chat, sounds like a challenge. <laughs> Panelists, for this part of the chat. Do I have a lifeline yes, I can call? Yes. There's a 50-50, we'll give you that. You will have five minutes each to respond. So we're gonna start with Lenore. Lenore? You are well known in many circles when it comes to diversity and inclusion work at a corporate level. Would you introduce yourself and share with us why access to opportunity is of importance to Deloitte and what your role is in this? Okay, I am at some point going to want to know why this is called Hoffman's Garage, though. Absolutely. That's I, I, everyone probably wonders that at some like. level. Uh, so my name is Lenore McAdam. I work in inclusion and diversity at Deloitte. I've had a number of roles there. I, I, uh, my, I started about seven years ago and became very involved in our diversity and inclusion space side of desk, and that's because I ran our LGBT employee resource group. And got, that just got me involved in the world in general. And as I moved along, and I had a day job and a gay job for a few years is how I used to put it. Uh, and then as I moved into my more HR policy role, uh, I was handed AODA compliance. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about accessibility beyond wheelchair ramps, like a lot of people. And uh, I, you know, we joke that accessibility can't be a checklist. It has to be a culture. And yet I started with a checklist and uh, actually grew to be a bit of an AODA lover, not the topic of today I know, um, but more not that it's, it's it achieved all of its goals, but it was a great place to start in corporate Canada. Because within Deloitte, we had it, discussions about accessibility at every level, website, in, in putting it into our performance management processes. How do we integrate it? And these were just conversations no one ever knew to have, much less wanted to have. So I actually thought that it was a great way to start, but that got me more involved in this world, in this space, and diving in a lot deeper. And so that's why I became uh, focused on that. And over the last year, because I've been now working in this space, I was offered a role where I'm focused now more broadly on inclusion and diversity as an overall corporate objective. Uh, and I think that it's been great that I've been able to bring the disability and accessibility awareness into the DNI journey, because as many people may know, corporate Canada is still, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this out loud, but I, I still feel we're just unduly still focused on gender and that it's all about women. And at the end, oh, let's get women first. Let's get women first. We'll get them done first, then this. Like there's some sort of a, checklist there right but uh so i think it's super important to include disability because intersectionality how all of our identities intersect is so key and disability mental health neurodiversity all of those things intersect and you can't really do one without the other so that's my journey uh, i think that within the context of a deloitte and why this is important within our context um in the corporate world, especially when you're working in a professional services firm, the ultimate objective has to be sort of, has to be business effectiveness. Now that doesn't mean that uh, creating a good and a humane environment is not an objective and that people there are automatons who don't care about anything but productivity. But one of the happy things we've been recognizing in the DNI space is that more diverse a workplace you have, the more diversity of thought that you have, and more uh, safe and accessible workplace you have, the more um, the more you have around uh, you, fewer sick days and fewer different measures. Within office spaces, it's actually quite difficult to measure productivity. Uh, when you're making one widget at a time, you can tell how many you make a day and that's easy to measure. But I don't know how many of you are in office jobs. If I were to say, tell me which day was the most productive last week, you may have a general sense. You probably wouldn't be able to tell me in any really effective way. And that's been one of my challenges this year. Uh, but I would say that from the perspective of my firm, uh, the at the end of the day, what we're, what, we're trying to create the ultimate meritocracy. I get this a lot. What about a meritocracy? Shouldn't we hire people because of their skills? Yes, 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 absolutely. We've literally been having that conversation for 30 years. But what we're really trying to do is create a meritocracy in the truest sense, where no matter how someone accesses their work or their technology, no matter what their background or matter, no matter uh, who they are, we're pulling people to the top that have the best ideas and the most creative and different and innovative ideas. And as a professional services firm where that is our work that we do, 
that's what's most important at the end of the day. So we try to focus everything within that. Wow, thank you. That, yes, yes. Did you want your 50-50 lifelines or anything right now? You're good? You're going to save it for the next round? Someone offered karaoke. So, I mean, that could sort of be the interlude between panelists if, if they're still open to that prospect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's early. <laughs> we promised a really fun and invigorating conversation <laughs> with energy and enthusiasm. Getting started. And we've, got, we've got karaoke going, and it's only 10, 10 15, or 10 20 in the morning. Super. Thank you guys. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lenore. Thank you for that. So now I'd like to ask Anna Karina to share with us who you are, how you came to know Sodexo, and why you decided to leave a very successful consulting practice and dive back into the corporate world. So my journey is very different from Lenore's, her day job and her gay job. Uh, my journey into the disability space is quite different. Um, up until quite recently, disability was not even on my radar. Um, I had considered myself very progressive um, and I had a professional career and then I got very ill. So that took me out of the game. So I was declared disabled and unable for any profession. Um, so as I was recovering, I discovered I surrounded myself with people with low vision, low hearing, mobility issues. And that really opened my eyes to the innovation, the troubleshooting that happens every single day just as they leave the house. So um, I'm going to really condense the story for the sake of time. You have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as I was as I was recovering, I felt it easier for myself rather than going back into the corporate world and having to disclose and having to ask for accommodations. It was easier for me to hang my own shingle and make my own accommodations as a consultant. So in my consultancy, I was also um, producing a documentary film called Talent Untapped. And so that put me in touch with people and organizations that were progressive. And in my search for an organization that was actually walking the talk, it was not easy to find. There are a lot of people who say a lot of great things and about doing the right thing. But when it came to actually seeing it and showing, showing me the evidence, I came across Sodexo. So three years of research and I landed on Sodexo. So I actually brought a camera crew in to one of um, Sodexo's business units where they feed about 3,000 people at a corporate headquarters. And in this particular business unit, about one in four employees works and manages with a disability. And I watched this and we captured this and I thought, this is pretty remarkable. It wasn't high tech. It wasn't complicated. Um, there were employees with hearing impairment. So there were notepads and paper at various parts. That's how they got their work done. The general manager didn't think that it was a big deal to have these stand-up uh, briefings. So instead of doing it in a big group, he would do it in smaller groups. So people with vision impairment or learning disabilities could understand better. So that is how I got to know Sodexo. And so uh, two years ago, um, I was approached to apply for a job. And I looked at the what they were looking for, I thought, I, I could do that, bilingual, a career communicator. I know crisis communications, reputation management, and it happened to be for an organization that I already knew. I didn't really know much about food services and facilities management, but what I did know was the corporate culture. I knew that they had a culture that was deliberately inclusive, and that's what pulled me in. It took me all of about 30 seconds to consider applying. So that's how I got to know Sodexo. And at the time, the conversation around accessibility was more safety, retention, employee engagement. That was the conversation about three to five years ago. Fast forward to today within Sodexo, it's a much different conversation because our rank and file, our management, they're there. They already know all of these benefits. So it's old news. The conversation that we're having now in Canada and at a global level is Let's prompt more disclosure and self-identification. Because when we know that we have more people who are comfortable to self-identify, we know that we've got the we know that we're progressing with our corporate culture. So I can tell you from firsthand experience, um, it took me a while to self-disclose because at the time, 
I view disability, especially a non-visible disability, um, the declining vision, neurological issues, I view that as a weakness. And I had to kind of wrap my head around, how am I going to explain this to peers and supervisors who may not be as open and as flexible? Um, here at Sodexo, it's really not a big deal. It's, okay, I need to work differently. That's all it is. I work differently. And so part of my work within Sodexo, and I sit on this global steering committee for disability is um, in different parts of the country, in different countries around the world, there are different levels of their conversation. So one thing that I'm trying to proactively do is show the benefits of owning your disability and realizing that it's not a liability, it's not a weakness, but it's a strength because we bring these different perspectives to our work to our projects, and it just enriches the workforce. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, um, I see we promised that this would be thought provoking. So thank you for that, for sharing that story with us. Now I'm going to ask Vera if she could share some things with us. Uh, Vera, would you be able to talk about the work that you're doing over at OCADU, I'm not going to say it all out in its full anymore, uh, at the Inclusive Design and Research Centre, and how accessibility includes things like systems and culture, that it's not always just about the physical build. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'm just going to step you back a little bit. The IDRC, where I work, um, has just celebrated 25 years last year. And it's kind of funny for me because I often feel that my goal is to not have a job anymore. <laughs> I would like to not have to be out uh, helping people understand how to create a culture of inclusion, but that is what I do a lot of. Um, but the interesting thing for me is I've been with the IDRC for 20 years. And um, when I was hired, I spoke to Yuta Trevoranis, and many of you might know Yuta, she's well known in the field. And I was talking about some work I was doing, putting documents online for analysts. And I said, oh, I, you know, I don't really think it's an, I don't think they're inclusive. I don't think they, the web is inclusive. And then I said, but you know, I don't uh, really, I guess someone who's blind wouldn't be reading documents anyway. And uh, sounds horrible, doesn't it? And, and, and I was at a point when I actually felt that I was uh, an accepting, knowledgeable person and it was, 20 years ago. However, that was really me speaking very ignorantly, but in part because I just really didn't know. I wasn't educated. I didn't understand that there were different ways to access the web. And I know better now. And I help other people know that now too. Fortunately, Yuta, you know, she said to me, but that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. And I said, oh, oh yeah, I guess it is. And I guess that was sufficient. Fortunately, she hired me and we've been together now for a long time, um, working on a lot of projects around developing a culture inclusion. And what I think is important to understand, I've heard uh, the other panelists talk about this idea about thinking about how things are done and processes and whatnot. And really, when I talk about a culture of inclusion, I am talking about learning to do things differently, learning to behave differently, learning to adapt, to make systems so that they are flexible, so that people have options. And, and this is a lot of the work that we do at the IDRC. And we started with standards and guidelines like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that many of you use. We were a large part of helping those get developed. We've moved through as technology has continued to proliferate everything that we do. Uh, we still work on inclusive technologies and developing systems that other people can use open source code so that people can develop inclusive and accessible systems that are technology based. But we also focus on inclusion in a different way. And inclusion to us means um, recognizing diversity, recognizing that people are different. If you are designing for the average person, you are designing for someone who does not exist. And so you want to have systems and processes that recognize diversity. When you are creating your systems and processes, you want to use tools that are inclusive and accessible and flexible. You need to have ways that people can do things differently, which really speaks to what you were saying. You just might do something differently. And, and then you also need to look at the broader impact of what you do and how that that can benefit others. 
And so this is what we call the three dimensions of inclusive design. And when you think about the world we are in, we create barriers when we have meetings, when we design buildings, when we do our, the things that we do, we create barriers. It's up to us to learn to recognize them and figure out ways to, you know, make choice, allow for adaptability and flexibility. And that's a lot of the work I do. Wow, that's, and it's fascinating to realize that the, the research center has been, you said 25 years? Yeah, we're in our 26 now. You're in your 26th year. So it's incredible, I guess, when you think about, um, to your point around, you hope that you're going to work your way out of a job. And I think for a lot of us that are in the room and a lot of us that are online, this is one of the things that we think about is, you know, if we actually get this right, we're going to, we're going to work our way out of a job, but it's also comforting to know that, that you can have this institutional knowledge now that people can build on and grow from when you have places like your center and like a lot of other organizations that are in this arena where they have been around for a number of years and they're, continuously evolving and building, but had no idea 20, 26 years. <laughs> and interestingly, I think here, I'll let you introduce and then I'll jump in, but I think it's not a necessarily a negative thing to be constantly on a journey. Yeah. Like it's a pretty Western idea that we have to be at this destination at some point and then we'll be done and like yeah. that'll feel better. But rather I think for this kind of work, it's actually better to always be doing it because we're always learning about ourselves and diversity and, and humanity and sort of this world. Yeah, we're constantly, we're constantly evolving and the institutions and organizations and businesses we're in need to be constantly evolving as well. And it is, it's a continuous journey and we promote that all the time. And we talk about the benefits of this and for people who have children, this is what you're always sort of instilling in them is this culture of learning. So there is no end game in the sense and you just as long as you're moving forward and you're improving then then you're making a difference and it's good you were chatting with a an unnamed... i'm gonna ask you to use a mic okay actually. i've got one i think oh. i should i should be mic'd can people not hear me yeah you can hear me okay oh, cool okay super. all right cheers you were, thank you you were so you were so of quiet. course no and i do, yes. do not project and i sound nasal and i've got a cold so if you can't hear me <laughs> let me know if you shook hands with jake today <laughs> yeah jake, i'm sorry if, if you're, you're online me, be sorry. very thankful for it <laughs> yeah um but some recent uh, conversation with a, an unnamed senior government official involved a comment on lifelong learning, which has become a bit of a mantra in the field that I work in, which is sort of online learning and education. And and the comment was, lifelong learning scares people. Uh, it's it's your whole life. Like how could you spend your whole life learning? And still, instead, let's talk about skills upgrading. And that way, it's sort of like a one time you can do it. It's low effort, and you're done. And I think that's sort of sad. Like. Some of these battles are hard and lifelong and will probably involve a combination of pain and pleasure for either a very long time or ever. But hopefully we will grow through them and, and become better. And now I'm speaking in really esoteric terms and maybe I'll get back to who I actually am and, and provide a little context on that. But if you don't mind, please. Jake, <laughs> last but not least on our panel, uh, if you can introduce yourself and your Happy role and, and speak to what what you see as access to opportunity and and diversity and inclusion within the context of LinkedIn and and maybe around this education and lifelong learning. Yeah, happy to. And I think interestingly, this this panel is an amazing representation of what for me is sort of the beginning of a long journey, um, because I'm definitely the most naive and least aware of uh, the world of accessibility and differently abled people from a academic standpoint on this panel because I don't work in it at all. Uh, technically, my job at LinkedIn is to sell online learning to colleges, universities, increasingly because I sort of expanded my mandate as I, I'll explain workforce development organizations and governments. But nothing in that mandate had the term or even a reference to uh, accessibility. And, uh, and so I, I've been learning on my own more or less over the past couple of years and, and with the help of amazing folks like Odin and like uh, the Inclusive Design Center, et cetera, Inclusive Design Research Center, et cetera. But, but as I said, you all really are part of sort of that, that journey in the sense that I came to LinkedIn to understand how uh, having worked in government and academia and the private sector, but running small companies, how corporate life would, would work. Uh, and part of that has been an understanding of how corporate life interacts with accessibility. Um, and uh, I've also sort of begun to come to terms with you know, what disability means for me. So 
whether it's addiction or other forms of disability, I think that self-recognition and then that ability to speak to it is, is a key part of it, as you were saying. Uh, and, and there's no organization, to be totally blunt, that has opened my eyes up to the positive possibilities of differently abled individuals greater than, than the IDRC and specifically your colleague Utah, who really came to us with ideas about how um, you could get beyond the black and white of uh, design principles that are visual on the internet and get a little deeper to natural language processing and how we actually start thinking about uh, or representing our thoughts and feelings online and what that could mean for inclusion. Um, so, so as I said, you, you represent my journey really quickly uh, to explain what I do and, and how I got here. Um, about uh, 12, 15 years ago, I was really distraught about some of the sort of the interna international wrongs that were happening in Rwanda and other places, and I decided to devote my career to that. So I went to law school, and when I was in law school, I started to get distracted by other ways of sort of combating wrongs uh, and eventually it became sort of fighting inequality instead of specifically human rights wrongs. Um, so worked at tribunals in The Hague, I was defending war criminals in Cambodia, I was at the Supreme Court of Israel sort of wrestling with human rights and, and the inequality and how to correct for it. Really dissatisfied with a lot of that world after a few years with the sort of the fact that I'm in Cambodia and, and the population there was not happy with having a tribunal sort of imposed on them for a variety of reasons or uh, I'm in Israel and, and the court isn't having the impact on its rights and economy that I was hoping. And uh, bizarrely, I came back and started working on intellectual property law because that was the other thing I studied in, in law school. <clears throat> and it actually had more to do with inequality and accessibility than human rights did. Um, because access to medicines was the single way that we most dramatically uh, increased access to uh, better standards of living around the world by far over the past century. And so I began to think at sort of a slightly more macro scale, okay, how do we change things globally for the better? And uh, in working on access to medicines via the pharmaceutical industry, via something called the Health Impact Fund, a proposed alternative to the patent system to incentivize drug development, um, and then starting a software development boot camp that's now in six cities across Canada, I was asked to work on access to education uh, by Gordon Brown, now UN Special Envoy for Education. And uh, that's when I came across LinkedIn. And LinkedIn at that point wasn't really thinking a lot about education, to be blunt. They were thinking about how to connect people and sales and talent and recruiting and that kind of stuff. And I got lucky. Uh, I joined our sales solutions team. And within uh, two days, we bought lynda.com, which was an online learning platform. And within a year, I moved into the first role up here in Canada related to online learning. And I was focused on higher ed, and a lot of the schools I was working with, the ones that really needed access to online learning, like think a small remote school in northern Ontario, couldn't afford it because we sell at scale. The more you buy, the less it costs. And that's interestingly a fundamental sort of principle of tech and software and scale and capitalism that is affecting accessibility because you need to have a lot of people in order to decrease the cost. And that doesn't work well in terms of access. And so I negotiated an agreement with the government of Ontario wherein they purchased access for a million uh, faculty, staff, and student ballpark across the 45 post-secondaries here, and that increased access in some ways. Um, but it was really just the beginning of that conversation, <clears throat> particularly because in, in coming to that agreement, we realized the people who most needed access were people who didn't have jobs and were not in school, i.e. people receiving workforce development or employment services. and those individuals didn't get access, even if they were at a college, to this uh, content. And so more, more recently, I've been trying to figure out how do I work with the employment services system? And that really was the introduction to, to Odin and to the folks uh, in this room. Uh, we've been talking to the CME. We've been, actually, we should be talking evidently to Sodexo. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, because understanding how to now increase access to our online learning and other aspects of our platform for, um, for individuals uh, with a variety of access accessibility challenges is, I think, in some ways, the next frontier for us as well and in my learning. Yeah, and I think probably all of us would agree with that. And I think that that really raises a good point around when you think about access, it comes in so many different forms. And as we talked about earlier, there's you know, these hopes and aspirations that we have for our loved ones and for the children that are coming up behind us. 
and you know that we want them to have these a the access to opportunity and and when somebody has access to education when they have access to education and services and supports and when they have access to opportunities within employment settings so where they can compete uh, and and it's it's accessible in all ways that's when we start to see some real success and some real progress in society so thank you jake for sharing all of that with us and um now there's just one final question and this is what i have nicknamed the speed round so our timekeeper is going to switch cards at the back of the room and our panelists are going to have three minutes that's it to answer these questions and um okay are you ready we're going to go in the same order how's that okay all right there's no lifelines there's no phoning a friend no it's done there's no karaoke nothing all right <laughs> that's after that's if you're online you're gonna miss it i'm sorry you should have come down for this uh okay so lenore what does access to opportunity mean to you so for me personally it's around it at high level it's around removing barriers so you simply this is just logical you, you cannot get the best people into an organization if you're putting up barriers whether they're technological whether they're physical, whether they're uh, attitudinal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It also means, though, from the, just, in, just from the sense of businesses bringing in more people that are diverse and specifically with disabilities, it also means access in terms of a pipeline. Because I talk to people on a regular basis, a big part of the business case seems to be talked about as it's all about talent, we're in a war for talent. Well, I talk to corporate recruiters all the time and never once has one said to me, oh, I just don't get enough resumes in the day. I mean, I, I have to go home at three o'clock. We have so few resumes, kind of kidding a bit. But um, there are a few particular types of roles, like, you know, a cyber scientist who has to speak Mandarin and, a, you know, uh, people that have degrees in computer science. Those are, there are, so that's something to pay attention to. But generally speaking, uh, corporate recruiting is an exclusive uh, process, it's not an inclusive one. And that's, that's the way it is. You have a pile of resumes, you have to take some out. So we need better ways of accessing diverse talent if we're going to get that diverse talent into the workplace. I also want to make one quick comment that I've been making on a few of these panels lately, and it is around the lumping in of mental health with disability right now that's happening in corporate Canada. So I think that in about a year, I think it's kind of on topic to what we're doing here, but in about a year, you're going to see folks high-fiving each other at the corner of Bay and King because their numbers of people with disabilities have gone up by five or six or seven hundred percent. And all that's going to represent is the fact that their existing employees with mental health issues have become more comfortable bringing and talking that, about that which is important and should be tracked and should be programmatized, don't get me wrong, but we will not have moved the, the dial at all on those with uh, visible or physical disabilities, however you want to put it, and we're not going to make any of those economic gains. We're not going to get any of those uh, people off ODSP, people not participating in the workforce where it's, such a, uh, where it's such a loss. So that's just something else I'd like to say around, a little bit around access, because if you're going to start counting and you're going to start bringing people in, understand who you want to bring in and uh, get rid of the barriers, but also think about how you're doing your counting. Wow. Thank you. And thank you for that insight. I don't know. That's news for me. That's something that I'll be looking at. And I think that Odin itself, maybe we'll take a look at that. And so hopefully that's something that, that everybody can look at in the future. And we are going to have a chance for questions. I promise. Okay. All right, Samantha, I promise. Um, okay, so Anna, so you did that in, in three minutes, under three minutes, right? All right, so. I, I respect Sue. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. You don't, you don't challenge Sue on the time cards. Before, yes. Saying. Okay, so next, uh, Anna Karina, what about you? Are there any sort of light bulb moments that have gone off for you when you think about access to opportunity and what that means? Funny you should mention light bulb because it reminds me of my first two weeks at Sodexo. So I've been with the organization for two years now. So a couple of years ago when I was being onboarded, I was at the Burlington office and normally I wear, if I go into any um, corporate office, I often wear different glasses with, um, with a light brown tint in my lenses because I need the light to go down for me. 
it's a trigger for me. And it, it, anyway, I was explaining it to a new colleague of mine in IT, and I was explaining to him why I wear these colored glasses. And he said to me, well, why don't I look into changing a light bulb? Why don't I look into a different temperature of light bulb to, to help you and other people who don't want such bright spaces? That was my light bulb moment. <laughs> that was my light bulb moment. Literally. And so really, what is the cost of that? That wasn't written into any policy or procedure, but that stuck with me even two years after because it really showed me what the corporate culture was like. That to me is true inclusion. Nobody said to him, go out there and change a light bulb. He proactively came to this. I never asked him for anything, but he proactively thought, how do I take down this barrier for, for my colleague? So that was a light bulb moment for me at this new workplace at Sodexo. Um, you were also talking, Jake, about where do corporations fit in when we're talking access accessibility? We have a huge role to play because we employ people. And so when we cast our net, to this diversity of talent, Lenore, and it doesn't matter what kind of abilities they have, it enriches all of us. So this is the role that we have to play, especially during this week, which is National Accessibility Week, when we're much more aware, I hope, of the barriers. I think as employers, we have the responsibility to proactively cast our net. And that's one huge way that we can take down barriers. Thank you. Welcome. So Vera, on to you, if you could let us know what access to opportunity means to you. Well, you know, when I think about access to opportunity, I really am thinking about uh, design and thinking about inclusion and how we are going about our day. One of my colleagues, Jess Mitchell, she likes to say, you know, in inclusion is like brushing your teeth. You really need to do it every day. And <laughs> And sometimes you change the tool and sometimes you get some help to make sure you're doing a good job and maybe you run your tongue over your teeth to check on how you're doing once in a while. <laughs> Grit your teeth, look in the mirror. Um, and so it's something you do, you check and you keep at it and you work at it. And when you are going about your day and planning things, think about what the requirements are. What are the functional requirements for someone to accomplish whatever task you want to set out for them? How can you make it so that there's multiple ways to do that task. When you're hiring, you know, look at your hiring process. What are your requirements? What kinds of information do you need? Are you requiring that people be there all, you know, full time? Is that necessary? Maybe you could break it into part-time work or work that could be done from home. So there's lots of ways to think about how you can be more inclusive. And when you are more inclusive, it benefits lots of people. It doesn't you know, just benefit that one person you might've been thinking about. It can, you know, a lot of people could benefit from working from home. I can tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm a parent. Um, it certainly is nice when I can work from home and uh, lucky me, I've been working from home for 20 years uh, <laughs> and not everybody can do that. Um, but this is being employed by someone who is flexible and adaptable. And when you do that in your own processes, in your own company, you kind of future proof yourself. You're ready for what comes at you. And so, you know, next time someone says, you know, what's the business case for accessibility? Um, you know, perhaps you might want to ask them, what, what's the business case for, you know, not allowing someone their basic human rights? Because that's what those barriers are. It's usually a form of discrimination. And we can unintentionally discriminate. So I'm think, saying to you, think about who's not at your table and why and how can you change it? Absolutely, thank you for that. And that to that point, we know that when we talk about this business case, uh, the business case that we present to corporations, to the private sector world, uh, sometimes you do wanna just ask the question about what's the cost if you don't do this? What are you missing out on? What aren't you adding to your workforce? What, what are you losing when you're not diverse and inclusive as a, as a business? and when that's not embedded right into the very culture of what it is that you do every day. Because, you know, to the points earlier about reflecting the community and reflecting the diversity and inclusion and harnessing all of this knowledge and talent and skill and different ways of thinking and seeing things. If you have always solved a problem a certain way, 
you're just going to keep solving it that way. So wouldn't you want to surround yourself with people who can look at things from different angles as well? So to that, thank you for that. And now lastly, Jake, I'm going to ask you the same question. If you can describe what access to opportunity means. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> gets back to an earlier question about Hoffman and Hoffman's garage, because uh, when I was quite young, Reed Hoffman went from the PayPal mafia, he was one of the founders of PayPal, to, to create LinkedIn, and he created a professional network. And at that point, that excited me in terms of my professional development, uh, but it's taken over a decade, I guess almost 15 years now, for me to understand that just the term professional in professional network is actually itself exclusionary. And I think LinkedIn has gradually begun to recognize that in a variety of forms. The most obvious one is going from a mission focused on empowering the world's professionals to a vision focused on empowering everyone. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's been pushed by some positive forces, so its acquisition by Microsoft I think has actually been very positive because uh, I, I think Microsoft is much more of a thought leader in this respect than, than most tech companies, uh, maybe even most organizations, and so we're learning from our parent organization in a really positive way that I think has even caught me by surprise. And uh, I think it's also personally been about understanding how to use the mechanisms that are at my disposal because I have very little influence over our product organization. Uh, it's sort of quite distant from my role within the company, right? There's 10 to 13,000 people at LinkedIn and somebody who's actually designing what a given page on LinkedIn looks like is quite far from somebody selling online learning to colleges, universities, and workplace development organizations. But via the kinds of public-private partnerships I was describing earlier, via the kinds of conversations we've been having with the IDRC and Odin and others, I think we're actually forming networks of real-world people that in turn influence how LinkedIn is used to increase accessibility. Um, we're either educating individuals on how they can use it or educating companies on how they can hire using it building best practices in terms of sort of talent and retention within organizations. Uh, and it's, it's developing those tools further and understanding the various contexts, non-professional contexts, for instance, in which they operate, uh, that, that I find most inspiring about, about working here and, and how we can apply it to accessibility. Okay, thank you very much. So that is the end of the speed rounds you all did it you all did it in under just under three minutes so that was that was perfect so thank you very much for that um so could everybody uh here and if you're online we won't hear you but please feel free to clap uh just join me in, <laughs> in thanking our panelists for that fast-paced and that insightful discussion so thank you very much Okay, and as promised, Samantha, we have we have a few minutes uh, available for some questions from the audience. And if you're online, I don't know about the capability of yeah, being we'll able to type to in. Ask, I think they're actually, where did Mickey go? Uh, yes. yes, they can. So you will be able to, so there's a number of people online. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Forgive us if we don't. And this uh, session is actually being recorded. So we'll be able to share this out. Um, and we have a roaming mic. Well, here, I can roam with it. I can roam. Yeah. I won't necessarily roam, but I will roam. I, and I'll ask you just to speak into the microphone when you have a question. So who has a question? Okay. No. No. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Asking kind of like. There you go. Ish. There Ooh, yay! Oh, yeah. I know what you mean. You it's feel great. like a like a god. Ah, oh, this is <laughs> um, <laughs> Tony Robbins. <laughs> so what I was gonna comment on, I found your. Um, I believe it was you that was talking about how mental health has kind of gotten lumped in with accessibility and disability and trying to improve that, that does not surprise me at all. Because when I was in seventh grade and I, w I myself have a disability, I'm visually impaired. And when I was put into accessibility classes, they would all, they would lump all of us together, anyone with a learning disability or hearing impairment. And it was kind of just, we're going to do this one thing and hopefully it helps all of you. 
And I find a lot of the times that it's always been grouped together because it's easier to label. I think one of you guys also mentioned like having a black or white label for people with disabilities. So I just thought it was very interesting because it's definitely been like a lifelong issue. It doesn't have to be a problem. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> It doesn't have to be a problem uh, because uh, it's, it, I, I still, we actually found that talking about mental health was actually a nice way to sort of open up the conversation around accessibility at Deloitte at one point. But what I'm, but I think that it's very important to keep track of those differently. And because sometimes you'll have 10 times or more people with invisible disabilities than visible disabilities. And uh, it's, two, it's two different types of barriers. Invisible disabilities in current employees uh, are barriers to performance management and progression through an organization, while visible disabilities often are barriers to getting the job at all. And I just think they need to be thought about and programmatized differently. Uh, and uh, not sort of swept under. No, it was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and just, just to add to Lenore's comment, it's really important that we remember that within disabilities, there's a huge range of diversity, just yes. like you were saying. Yes. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, and it's not because you have a, you, you're low vision, you have vision impairment, uh, someone with, uh, I don't know, chronic pain, for example. It may not work for the both of you. You know, so again, it's that conscious remembering that within disability, there's a huge diversity. Yeah, I think one of the more profound learnings that I've had in the past year was that there is more diversity within the differently abled population than there is within the rest of the population, which is also how there's more lessons to be learned from in some ways that population. So, so I'm going to ask that I read one from online because sure. that's really exciting. Do thing next. Clearly, I use technology all the time. Uh, so we have David Allen Smith, who has asking, do you know of any research articles that prove hiring a person who has a disability will increase the gross sales of a company? Uh, I'd like to suggest that you go to the Return on Disability website as a start. Um, in fact, I think Deloitte's published a recent report around this as well. But I think I think return on disability um, it, it, with Rich Donovan's group. But if you search return on disability, you'll they'll have some uh, articles you can cite. Uh, and if you like, uh, you know, I think you can probably look me up at the IDRC, and I could um, point you to some other articles uh, if you if you need that kind of information. So here's one thing, and people with disabilities know this. People with disabilities tend to be the most loyal. So if we happen to find a restaurant or a retailer that's accessible for us, that's in tune to what we need, we go there. And we go there often. And if it doesn't work for us, we tell all of our friends and relatives. So when you consider the purchasing power of its one billion people with disabilities around the world and the spending power, again, this is a return on disability uh, fact and research, um, that's a lot of buying power. A little bit, just a counter to that. I think we need to be a little careful. I know that, I know that research really well and know Rich well and respect him and know that, um, all of that. But I think to the diversity of people with disabilities, I think we overstate this $18 trillion, it's a bigger every time I hear it, uh, because we're talking about very different uh, disabilities. And I sometimes think we, yeah, and uh, I think that for three great examples, one is return on disability, Rich Donovan. The other is Mark Wafer, who ran a series of Tim Hortons uh, that showed some really strong business results. And also uh, there is a Walgreens in the United States, Randy Lewis. So those are the ones that that's not so much sales, but productivity, but that's something, those give some relatively good quantitative. One other point there is that uh, you mentioned you can sort of look you up. I can't, uh, at LinkedIn, not say you can look all of us up, uh, either <laughs> add us on LinkedIn, but also just send us an email or tweet at us or whatever else in order to continue this conversation because I think each of us has different resources to share and I think Odin does as well, uh, as, as well as probably many people in this audience. So let's continue this conversation online and hopefully increase uh, its, its scope in that respect. I had a question from this side of the room. 
Thank you everyone for, for the panel this morning. I think the piece, uh, so I'm Wayne Henshaw, I'm a person with a, a vision impairment. Uh, and the thing that I take and I would ask all of us in the room and especially during this week is that aha moment or the light bulb moment. I think I, I don't pick up light bulbs, so I'll go with aha moment. Um, <laughs> but aha moments, if we can each do that, that in, in what we do, uh, I, I was involved in onboarding a new employee and I had a aha moment myself as I was doing that uh, just within the last day and and so as you look at those aha moments that moving that needle just making one incremental step can help us get to the goal and I always use the term it's an evolution not a revolution but if we can make incremental steps and so I, I guess the challenge I put out to all of us including myself as I speak is try and find that aha moment or the light bulb I love the analogy um, because that it can make a, a positive change for everyone not just you and that particular circumstance, but everyone else that's coming after you. Thank you, Wayne, for that commentary. Um, are there any other questions online? Are there any? No, you're still all there because we can see the numbers. So <laughs> I, I know two of you left, but you had a meeting, I'm sure. So it's fine. You're <laughs> double booked. You're excused. Um, okay, well then, on that note, I would just again like to thank the panelists. Uh, so Lenore, Anna Karina, Vera, Jake, thank you so much. And also thank you to your organizations. Uh, so to Deloitte, to Sodexo, to Ontario College, Ontario, the I IRDC at OCADU, and LinkedIn Canada. Um, thank you to them as well for sharing you today and for um, for letting you come out and have this conversation with us. Um, and I just have a question actually for people in the audience. So this is just a little tiny exercise. And if you're online, you can put, oh, see somebody came back because they saw it got interactive. Um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and just raise your, raise your hand. Um, my question to you is what percentage of people uh, who have it? What's the percentage of people in our population in Canada who would identify as having a disability? Is it ten percent? Can't see you online, but that's okay. Um, is it forty percent, or are we talking about twenty-two percent? Oh, okay. All right. And so, so. Oh, yes, I should actually. So absolutely nobody raised their hand at the 10% and absolutely nobody raised their hand. It was at 30 or 40%. And for, oh, did somebody raise their hand online? You're thinking it's 40? Okay. So we have a 15% online and between 16 and 30% is an, Okay, is another is another answer online. So thank you for participating in that. About one fifth of the population. Okay, one in five. So the stat is exactly around there. Uh, according to Stats Canada's latest report that I think was 2018, uh, we're looking at about 22% of the population in Canada being identified as being a person who has a disability. Now those numbers could potentially be much different than that because not everybody self-discloses, not everybody identifies. And the other thing that we know is that that number is going to be continuously changing. And so for some people, when you talk about disability, there can be episodic disability. So at times they identify and at times they don't. Um, and as we all get a little bit older, the population is changing and there are disabilities that will come on um, as we as we age in life. Um, so I just want people to sort of think about that, that, that in Ontario, when we have this kind of conversation, we're talking about 3.1 million people. And that's a, that's a really large number. And then we know we were just talking about the return on disability and, uh, and all of Rich Donovan's work. When we talk about the impact, when you add close friends and family to that number, we're talking about 50, 53, 55% of the population is impacted, they're affected um, or affected in some way by disability. And so this is a conversation that we need to keep going at all times. And so on that note, 
I'm going to challenge you today to think about the business or the organization that you're in. And I want you to think about how you're ensuring that there is access to opportunity. I want you to ask yourself, people who identify as having a disability can access opportunity to become an employee at the company that you're in, at the organization that you're in. And I want you to think about what you can do to improve access. And when you go back to work today, what conversations you can start there to help your business to increase access. So on behalf of the Ontario Disability Employment Network and LinkedIn Canada as our host, um, I do thank you very much for joining us today. And to Jake's point, if you would like to continue this conversation with us, please join us online. Please connect with us through LinkedIn. This uh, recording, this has been recorded and it's going to be available. Uh, so we'll distribute it widely and we encourage you to share it. Please look us up and you can also contact us at Odin Network. So O-D-E network.com. And if you reach out to us, we'll share all of the contact information that we can. So thank you once again for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.